Uh, this next session is a really interesting and important one. We are, for the next few sessions, we're going to start, not going to start, we're going we're gonna to dive deeper into economics and the financial aspects of developing projects in remote communities. We've heard for the past three days the, the significant importance and reliance on government funding for programs, capacity building, capital to get projects built. Uh, but based on the direction that we need to go and the amount of progress that we need to make and the short amount of time that we need to do that, I heard yesterday that it was, it's both a sprint and a marathon. I think we need to continue the conversation and open up into private investment and private capital. So the question that we're going to entertain on this panel is, what is the appetite and interest and solutions to bring private investment into remote uh, indigenous clean energy projects, whether it's ener energy efficiency, housing, renewable energy? And there's lots of interest. We've had um, a great time putting this panel together. Uh, Linda Cody, uh, our executive director, will introduce everybody. We have two people joining us virtually. Uh, I'll uh, leave that to Linda to, to welcome them. Uh, one unfortunately got COVID, so he had to stay at home. So welcome to this conversation of, of discussing the important role that uh, private investment, uh, community investment banks, uh, we have First Nation Finance Authority here, we have the uh, uh, Canada Infrastructure Bank and a private investment on their ideas, interests, solutions to increase the amount of capital available to projects. So Linda, over to you. Okay, thank you. Number one. Mike. Can you hear me? Mike one. Mike one. Check, check. It would help to turn on the button. Hey, this is just like we're on Zoom. <laughs> turn on your mic. <laughs> <laughs> We're all so used to that now. So welcome everybody uh, to this session this afternoon. We've heard a lot yesterday and today about how vital and foundational uh, community and government support is uh, to building the projects that will work in remote communities and also to building the people and the skills that can lead those projects and um, execute them over a period of time successfully. So, uh, but we've also heard that communities and governments can't do it alone if we want to make diesel history. So there is a need for more diversified, more access, more diversified access to um, resources. And as we heard this morning, again, the new news on the horizon then, for a lot of the reasons we've been discussing at this um, conference, uh, new pathways and access to capital and markets for capital and financing are emerging now. Um, and this panel this afternoon is going to take a look at some of them. And so you can consider uh, which ones might be applicable to you. So I'm really pleased to introduce to you uh, in person and virtually our four panelists. First of all, I'll just introduce Hillary Thatcher, who is the senior director for the Canada Infrastructure Bank, and Hillary leads CIB's relationships with First Nations, Métis, and Inuit communities across Canada, and she's previously served as a director at Indigenous Services Canada and has 15 years of experience with the Ontario Public Service. Um, also with us virtually this afternoon is coming in from Toronto, I believe. Sorry, and Hillary, I believe, is in Vancouver today. I'm not quite sure, but she can confirm that. Uh, coming in from Toronto is Nate Lobier Lewis, who's vice president of Spring Lane Capital, and he's with us despite the fact that he's got COVID today. So, Nate, I hope you're feeling better. Um, he is responsible for origination, due diligence, structuring, and execution of the investments with a focus on Canada and Quebec. And before joining Spring Lane, Nate was a managing director of an infrastructure uh, consulting company where he managed the infrastructure development unit. So with me live and in person, I'm pleased to introduce to you Ernie Daniels here. 
um, president and CEO of the First Nations Financing Authority. Ernie is a professional chartered accountant and a certified Aboriginal finance manager. He has worked for many different Indigenous-led organizations, including the Aboriginal Financial Officers Association of Canada and the Aboriginal Healing Foundation. So he has a lot of experience we can draw on. And last but not least, uh, from Vancouver, Vince Gaspasio, who is the Managing Director, Corporate Development and Clean Energy Finance for Van City Community Investment Bank. Vince has over 15 years experience in capital markets and public policies, and he is responsible for driving growth and contrib contributing to Van City's mission of financing a sustainable tomorrow. And um, Vince and Ernie asked me to tell you that when the bar opens at 5.30 tonight before the gala, they'll be there with their checkbooks. So you gotta, you gotta pay attention to what they're saying now. But, um, so we've got a little bit, uh, <laughs> if you want to ask them the right question. So uh, we've got a little bit of a different structure for um, this presentation this afternoon. Um, the, the panel has agreed upon three questions. We'll do three questions up here, round robin, if I pick them up from the floor here. And, uh, and then we'll open it up to questions from the, from the audience, okay? So I think I'll start with our virtual participants first. So I'll go to Hillary uh, first. Um, so and the question is, beginning with Hillary, is what is the role of your organization in the private investment space? What is your strategy? And can you provide a few examples of the type of projects and partnerships that you invest in? Hillary. Thank you. And uh, I, I want to thank all the participants uh, for your patience with me, my um, I'm, I'm in a remote location um, on the beautiful uh, Sunshine Coast of British Columbia in the unceded traditional territory of the Shishal uh, Nation, and uh, I'm, it's a, quite an honor to be here with you today. So to answer your question, Linda, uh, the Canada Infrastructure Bank was designed to uh, to fill gaps, so either you know economic gaps or structural lending gaps, and so. When we're making investments on Indigenous and remote projects, and my role is um, specifically uh, to look at Indigenous community-based projects and Northern remote projects, and in any of the asset classes that the bank operates. So the focus today is obviously the off-diesel, so we'll talk about clean power. Um, when we're talking about filling gaps, what, what I mean by that is um, if the bank isn't needed and if private capital and higher rates of interest can fill those gaps, the economic gaps, the bank doesn't need to be present in the deal. Um, but in the case of remote communities, we know and we recognize that often expensive capital or um, higher rates of interest that private capital could bring to the table, uh, private lenders might bring to the table, um, you know, make the deal uneconomic. And so, you know, the Canada Infrastructure Bank as a gap filler will unpack the deal, try and figure out what the economic um, returns of the deal are and try and help um, to secure certain, like, uh, um, uh, a reasonable return for the project proponents, uh, be they the communities, uh, which is what uh, we're always striving for, or their private sector partners and the communities, and um, try and marry that with the, the right amount of grants with the, with the Canada Infrastructure Bank. And as I said, if there's other private capital that can fill those gaps because the returns are great enough that you know, borrowing and, and financing with debt from other private or institutional lenders is viable, then the Canada Infrastructure Bank isn't needed. What we are finding on the, um, and in the Indigenous Community Infrastructure Initiative, we have uh, a minimum investment threshold of $5 million, um, and we can, we can come in with up to 80% of the capital. With remote projects and off-diesel projects, because of the uh, displaced cost of diesel, uh, often the PPAs aren't, aren't high enough, the returns on those PPAs aren't high enough um, for, um, for a large subset of, of CIB debt. But again, it depends on, on the project. And a couple of examples, as you've asked for, of the types of deals we're working on. We're working with remote communities, both in, in, in uh, Nunavut. I've, uh, there's a deal we're working on in uh, Northern, Northwest Territories a number of uh, diesel-reliant communities across the country um, where we are marrying um, uh, NRCAN funding and Government of Canada and territorial and provincial uh, grants with small amounts of CIB debt. 
Um, and uh, it seems to be, you know, a recipe that's working. When it comes to large projects that are, are serving an, an off diesel need, um, the bank has, um, and I can speak publicly about it because it's a public pro project, we have been working closely with uh, the Inuit of the Cavalli region on a large diesel project. And that project itself um, is very substantive and we're working to um, project to partner with the Inuit capital, private sector capital, um, federal grants and uh, territorial contributions, and then uh, the bank's contribution through through debt financing. So we're low cost capital, we're concessionary. If the if it's base projects, anything between five million and a hundred million, um, you know, our concessional rates are around one percent, and we can invest for the life of the asset or the term of the uh, the PPA or the the uh, the contract term. So. Um, we really are quite flexible, but we're always looking to crowd in private capital. And so in, in some of the projects we've worked on, we're working alongside uh, other investors, including Spring Lane Capital or First Nations Bank and, and other institutions. So that's how we uh, that's how we uh, operate. And and um, and I'll leave it to the next uh, okay. guest to share. OK, thanks, Hillary. That's good. So that's your space. You're literally looking in the, at that gap, Nate. I um, hope you can all hear me. And, and first of all, thanks for your well wishes, but I will uh, let you know that I, I don't actually have COVID. I just had a close contact. My son, uh, who is seven, spent the day with someone who then got COVID on Thursday. So if I do get it in the next couple of days, I will store your well wishes and, and, and open them then. <laughs> You'll uh, have fingers. to send us an email to let us know how it turns out. Okay. But so far, I'm fine. I'm talking to you from... Uh, from Montreal, uh, where unfortunately for a day in late April, it is snowing, which is somewhat odd. Um, all, the, all the more reason to be working on these, these projects that, uh, that are addressing climate change, but uh, I'll digress on that. First, a bit on my background. I, I've spent, as, as um, you said, Linda, the last decade almost working on project development. First, uh, I started my career there, mostly working in emerging markets in a lot of developing countries where we were working very closely with local communities to develop renewable energy projects and now work with, with Spring Lane Capital uh, doing a lot of the same stuff. Uh, Spring Lane Capital, we're, we're a private equity group based in Montreal and Boston. Uh, so I guess we're that expensive capital that uh, Hillary was, was referencing. <laughs> And um, I, I'm really sad that I that I was not able to attend this event because first and foremost, I wanted to come to, to learn both professionally and personally. I, I find this to be a really fascinating area and, and one that is that is really ripe for um, investment. Well, I, I can imagine our, our type of capital, which I'll get to in a moment, is not um, suitable for every project. Uh, it's something that, that you know, as as um, as a, as a country we need to, uh, we need to address. Um, so what does Spring Lane do? We, we, are, we were built to address a unique gap in the clean tech space. Um, our, our team has been investing in, in, in various ways in clean tech for the last 15, 20 years and realized that a lot of innovation in clean tech is smaller scale and project based. So projects that are between you know, less than a million dollars to, to $10 million of equity. And, and, there's, and there's very few groups that are willing to uh, invest directly into projects at that size. And that, that's a real gap in the market and um, can lead to some interesting innovation. And so our, our strategy really is to look for developers or platforms or technology company, technology innovators that are implementing new, mostly proven technologies um, that are that scale. And we invest a little bit of money into the company itself or the developer, and then set up a project pool where we define upfront what a project looks like. And then um, that gives the developer or the, 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 the entrepreneur the, the ability to come, to, to go out, develop the project and come to us with, knowing that they have, have funding and, and, uh, and, and, and backing uh, from, from a group like us. And we try to aggregate a number of smaller projects to get to a size that then uh, makes um, uh, more sense in terms of an economic asset. 
and, and that allows us to work really hard to structure the first one because these these projects, uh, all the projects that we do, but in particular projects uh, in, in, in remote communities can, can be really challenging to, to structure. Um, so what do we, um, a couple of example projects that we've worked on, we do everything from water, energy, waste, um, uh, food to a certain extent, so controlled environment, agriculture, as well as, uh, as, well as mobility. We've invested in uh, modular wa um, water treatment for, for factories like breweries and wineries, and, and, and we invest off um, uh, water energy purchase agreements for effectively like DPAs, but for water, uh, for water treatment. Our com companies pay no upfront cost, and we install a, a, an asset and, um, and then get paid back over the life of the project. Uh, we're working with um, Canada Infrastructure Bank for uh, with, on a project on um, uh, a First Nations um, reserve in, in the Vancouver area to develop an anaerobic digester with a platform company called Andion that we invested in. And in every case, we are, and I think this is an important distinction uh, from the rest of the, the folks on this panel, project equity. So we really work with the sponsor and the developer to either own directly the asset, always through a joint venture with, with the developer or a part of it, and then work with the developer to structure whatever else is needed. So debt, um, potential for grant financing, EPC contracts, all the different bits and pieces that are required for a, for a, a, a successful project. So again, really sorry I couldn't be there in, per in person. I, I, was, I was really looking forward to potentially meeting folks with interesting projects and, and, and seeing how Spring Lane can, can uh, help solve this, uh, this, this pressing challenge. But hopefully some of you will reach out um, and, and uh, there'll be another chance to meet in, in the future. Oh, I'm, I'm sure there will be. Okay, well, thanks, Nate. So Nate's uh, company particularly interested in leading edge clean tech and also act, can act as an aggregator. Okay, Vince, over to you, Van City. Great. Hello, there we go. Um, yeah, so my name is Vince Casparo. Uh, I am the Managing Director of Corporate Development and Clean Energy Finance at Van City. Uh, for all of you uh, who don't know, Van City is the largest credit union uh, in the country. Uh, I work for a subsidiary of, uh, of uh, the parent company called Van City Community Investment Bank and uh, I run their clean energy business. Um, we provide project finance uh, to projects uh, right across the country. Uh, we have financed um, technology types uh, in solar, wind, uh, battery storage, uh, waste to energy, wastewater to energy, uh, geothermal, uh, biomass, um, and building, in, uh, uh, building retrofits. And again, right across the country, usually uh, with debt. Uh, a couple of transactions that uh, we have financed. Um, one, uh, we financed the equity position of the Six Nations of the Grand Rivers. Um, uh, like I said, equity position in Ontario's second largest wind farm, 230 megawatt uh, wind farm. Uh, and we partnered with uh, the Canada Infrastructure Bank on the largest wastewater to energy project in the world uh, happening in Toronto. Um, and it takes the heat off the wastewater uh, from the municipal wastewater system in, in Toronto and it will offset uh, the natural gas uh, usage of Toronto Western Hospital by 90%. So it will uh, save the hospital about a million dollars a year per year for 30 years. And while all that is happening, uh, it is uh, taking, uh, removing 250,000 tons of GHG emissions from, um, uh, from the hospital, which is the equivalent of taking 1,811 cars off the road every year per year for 30 years. So when you talk about Build Back Better, when you talk about um, uh, sort of moving uh, forward uh, collectively, this is the way uh, it, it is being done. And, and I'm glad the, the point was made earlier. Government cannot do this alone. I want to be perfectly clear. Municipal, municipalities can't do it alone. Um, uh, provinces, territories, 
the feds cannot do it alone. Bay Street can't do it alone. Academia cannot do it alone. Not-for-profits can't do it, do it alone. All of you can't do it by yourselves. We all have to work collectively together. And the way we're going to be able to do this is by layering on the capital that you all need to develop these projects that are critically important for your communities and critically important for the environment. And someone said it earlier, 2030 is right around the corner. We have to get on, like we, we just have to move on this. The time for dithering, the time for, you know, uh, you know, maybes and buts and ifs and all sorts of ambiguity is over. We don't have the time. So um, it is really refreshing hearing some of the comments and remarks here uh, over the last couple of days. And uh, I don't want to suck up any more oxygen. I'll suck up some more a little later. <laughs> You'll get more uh, later. And, uh, and I, I look forward to chatting with all of you about some of the things that, that uh, we can do. Thank you. OK. Thanks, Viv. So what we sort of see emerging here is different sort of a, a stack of capital, right? And they, they can address different aspects of risks around the project. So OK, Ernie, you're up, First Nations Financing Authority. Uh, good afternoon. <clears throat> really nice to be here in Whitehorse. Haven't been here in a while. Uh, just for your information, I'm uh, originally from the Northwest Territories, born and raised, educated there, got my iconic designation there. I'm a member of the Salt River First Nation uh, near the town of Fort Smith, so Cree Dene. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, so the, the First Nation Finance Authority is uh, very different than uh, any of the other models that. Uh, that, that are here today. We operate uh, under fiscal, uh, uh, First Nation Fiscal Management Act, which is a government legislation. So the, the, the whole purpose of the act in forming the FNFA was to give First Nation governments the same access to the capital markets that other levels of government currently enjoy. And so we do this by uh, issuing debentures uh, on the capital markets. Uh, and in order to do that, you need to be rated. So we have two uh, independent uh, credit ratings, one with Moody's and S&P, which very res respectable ratings, we're double A. And so we operate in the municipal index. And so we provide uh, fixed financing, fixed interest rates for up to 30 years. We can do that. So to date, we've actually financed uh, pretty close to $2 billion since 2014 when our first debenture went out. And, um, the, the result of that has been uh, mainly infrastructure, uh, economic development, social development, and for uh, green energy. Uh, just uh, w one of the aspects of our model is that th there's a process to get to us, to, uh, to borrow from us. First Nations have to go and get uh, certified through our sister organization called the First Nation Financial Management Board. And that's about capacity building. It's about uh, setting in place a, um, a financial administration law that's standardized uh, in terms of how you manage your, uh, your finances uh, and your whole financial model in terms of uh, the leveraging of debt and, and how much debt you can take on. So really, uh, just to talk about uh, some of the, the projects we, uh, we worked on uh, would give you a better idea in scope. We, we actually, I, I don't know if anybody ever, if you, did you have lobster lately? Probably, maybe, I don't know. But if you haven't, <coughs> uh, we actually financed uh, seven Mi'kmaq communities in the Atlantic to acquire 50% interest of Clearwater Seafoods, which is the largest seafood company in, in North America. It was a $250 million venture. So, and the other, the other projects is uh, Henby Inlet in, uh, in Ontario. They had the largest wind, wind farm project on, on the books back then. I don't know if it still is or not, but they were about to lose their equity interest in, into this uh, project with cost overruns. And the cost overruns were, was over $100 million. So we stepped up, we worked with them, and we provided that financing to them so that they could keep their project. And now they're... They're, they're generating uh, pretty close to $10 million a year, which goes into social development for the community. So really holistic. Um, and, the, and the other one is uh, Tacker River Plinkett uh, in, in Tacker River. 
They did a project a number of years ago before any of this stuff was talked about. They had to go through all the regulations and everything else just to get this, pro and, and they were off the grid. So they did a really small uh, um, hydro project. And now they're looking at expanding that and selling power to the Yukon. So it's, uh, it, it, just, it just goes to show you, you, you help these First Nations with equity, with uh, other investments. It just generates into more economic development for them. And once they do that, they're building infrastructure in their communities. And that's, that's, what, that's what we're all about. So uh, I know I'm running out of time here pretty, uh, pretty quickly, but uh, um, <clears throat> I, I think uh, one of the things we've been working on is to try to close the infrastructure gap that exists in First Nations communities and in, in Indigenous communities across Canada. It's an access of $30 billion. That's a lot of money. And, uh, you know, First Nations can't do this with their own source revenues. And that's what they've been doing to date. And the, the whole current government system of funding infrastructure just doesn't work. It's a pay-as-you-go system. When you, build, when you buy a house, you're not saving up and paying for it all at once. You're leveraging your salary. And so this is what we're talking about, closing an infrastructure gap in, in First Nations uh, communities, is to... Uh, leverage government uh, transfers. It, it, it doesn't happen right now. We need to do that. That's the only way we're gonna close this infrastructure gap. Closing this infrastructure gap means building all the infrastructure communities need to really develop further economic development and uh, and a further uh, well-being of their communities. So, thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, just two more quick questions. I'll ask the panelists to be a little bit briefer, although the content was very good. You get top marks on content. But just two more quick questions, because these are the ones you wanted me to ask. So we'll start with Hillary. Hillary, it goes without saying that all of the projects involved here have to... Hillary, are you there? <laughs> okay. Maybe we'll... I am. Are you there? Okay, good. Um, besides a good economic case, what benefits are you looking at for in the projects that you invest in? And can you specifically address indigenous energy sovereignty and decolonization? Are those values on your screen? Uh, they are. And in fact, the, the Canada Infrastructure Bank, when we invest, we invest concessionary capital. So we invest um, not so that we make a profit. We invest so that we get we get our capital back. So at 1%, um, it actually is um, a loss to the Canada Infrastructure Bank. So we're not investing for profit. And so what we are investing for is projects to be built and to close the gap in Indigenous communities so that communities have equitable access to clean power, clean drinking water, you know, bridges, paved roads, the things that we take for granted in the South in particular and in Oops. Okay, I'm uh, Hillary will be back, but I'm just going to go. How much GHG oh, reduction? Okay. How much GHG reduction is happening? And that's uh, the key impact and metric that we're looking for um, in our investment. So it's about equitable access to good infrastructure, reliable infrastructure, and clean power. And it's about um, GHG reduction. So that's how we measure impact. Okay, Nate, you're up. Very similar. I mean, I'll say we're, we're, a, we're a private equity fund with, with limited partners or investors who are pension funds and you know, other financially motivated investors. So we, we don't market ourselves as an impact fund per se. But that being said, everything we do has to have a strong sustainability thesis. And underpinning that is really, uh, first and foremost, GHG reduction or, or, or mitigation, so, so carbon impact. Um, and, and then we do look for other um, uh, other impact as well. So you know, things that we can measure, like liters of clean water, or or, or whatever the case may be. And, and we say that we try to be very investment specific and not have a, a, a framework that we've that we've created beforehand. We're very open about what we measure, and we, we produce an impact report every year. Uh, but um, we don't have other than GHG. We we don't really have. Um, uh, a, a specific kind of framework that we look to for um, for our, our impact. Um, yeah. So uh, and then, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there. Okay. <laughs> Vince, what's your evaluation framework? Yeah. Um, so impact is incredibly important. 
uh, and I think I was talking uh, to some folks earlier about this. Um, when I present a financing to my investment committee, uh, 1A, and I'm being a, a very explicit in terms of the ranking, 1A is the economics. Because if the economics don't work, it just the, the whole thing falls apart and I have a regulator. I can't take inordinate amount of risk with depositors' money. 1B, not number two, but 1B is I have to lay out very clearly what the ESG metrics are uh, for a particular project. GHG avoidance, um, uh, GHG reduction, and social and governance uh, in, uh, metrics as well are incredibly important. So I think th that, that piece is very clear. Uh, the second point is, um, and you know, uh, I always look at what people, yes, what people say is important, but also look at what they do. And uh, Van City is as progressive, really, as, uh, as any financial institution in this country. Um, uh, and th there are certain things that are uh, very prevalent, for example, I report directly to the CEO of Van City. So there is no in between. Uh, I report directly to the boss, and, and Christine Bergeron comes from clean tech. So ESG and, and climate is really embedded in, in who we are. And from a reconciliation standpoint, you look at Van City's history. Um, uh, uh, there were some folks yesterday from Bella Bella. Um, Van City uh, was told that they needed uh, a clinic, Van City uh, uh, provided $100,000 to the community to, to have a clinic. When uh, Van City was told um, th there was a, a need for banking services, they were the first financial institution to put uh, banking, um, a branch up in alert. Um, so, you know, don't look at what people say, look at what they do. And uh, I can tell you uh, everything we do is, is ESG based. Um, and uh, again, look at some of the transactions I, I laid out. For example, with the Six Nations of the Grand River, that refinancing of their equity, and I'm glad Ernie mentioned um, uh, uh, economic development, that on a net present value basis, that's gonna provide a, about $13 million back into the community, and they, they end up owning, um, by the time the life of the loan is, uh, um, uh, the term of the loan has uh, expired, um, uh, ended up owning a 230 megawatt wind farm. So uh, again, there are real tangible examples of what we do at Van City, uh, and it is, it is very much grounded in climate and reconciliation. And, uh, and uh, I'm proud to work for an organization like that, and I hopefully got a chance to work with some of you. Okay, thanks. Ernie, you talked about social development, and you know, um, and that's a big part of your mandate. It's a lot easier, it seems to me, to measure greenhouse gases than it is to value social development. How do you, how do, you do that? Uh, <coughs> yeah, our, 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 our model is, uh, it's, it's totally based on the, the First Nations that, that join us, that become members. It's, they, they actually come to us with their projects. We're not evaluating their projects so much. Uh, we're about, it's, it's, they need to have an existing revenue stream or some revenue stream that will support a long-term uh, loan, like could be up to 30 years. So they need to have a contract or like a, a, really, um, a really solid revenue stream that will back that. It, it, the other thing is that uh, we also uh, look at uh, ESG. It's really important today. It's extremely important today in just about every aspect that First Nations and Indigenous people are involved in really hit the different metrics in ESG. Uh, either governance, social, or economical. We're like we're, we're, we're involved in that. And, and uh, so I, I we it's the First Nations revenue that really determines the type of uh, what they can actually build and how much they can borrow. It's based on the on, on that uh, on that factor. So uh, our our board is made up of our members. Uh, when we go to the marketplace, we uh, we get a credit rating. It's not the same as a bank rate. Very different, and we pass that on to the First Nation because we're not for profit. We're marking it up to cover. Uh, a cost of uh, issuing the debt, our legal costs. For example, uh, 
last month we issued our ninth debenture successfully in the marketplace. And it was at a time that uh, interest rates were starting to go up. The uh, Russia invaded Ukraine. So it was really turmoil in the markets for a while. But because we had the, the metrics of ESG, uh, we were able to go out and issue a $354 million bond for 19 First Nations that finance a number of their projects, uh, a lot of different types of projects. So it's really important. So we collect the information on that uh, because we need to do that in order for us to uh, attract the investors to buy our debt. And uh, really happy to say that we expanded that investor base and now we have Asian investors investing with us, mainly because of the ESG component. We, all, we have the Middle East and Europe and the US buying our bonds right now. So our bonds are known all over the world. Our, our credit story is well known from all different in, in, uh, investors, which bodes well for the future of First Nations financing their projects and really uh, a cost uh, effective financing, a cost of financing uh, in, in the, probably the, the one, of the, one of the cheapest around because it makes a difference when you're looking at your rate of return on your project what the cost of your financing is. And so we're able to bring that to, to assist the First Nations that are working with us, so thank you. Okay. Um, Hillary, are you there? I just wanna do... I am. Okay, Hillary, um, just before we do our last question in the round robin, I've got an acronym check and I'm gonna pick on you. What does ESG stand for, Hillary? It's uh, environmental, social, and governance. So when we look at uh, the compilation of um, the, the product or the, the, uh, the uh, investment, we look at whether or not there's environmental attributes. Um, and in that case, we're looking at GHG reduction when, when we're talking about off diesel typically. Um, and, you know, degradation of land and water and those types of things. On the governance side, we're looking at, you know, is the company that we're investing in, does they have, do they have diversity in their board? Do they have you know, senior folks who represent women and gender diversity and, and you know, ethnic or cultural diversity. And then um, from a social side, we're looking at, you know, how is this, this project and how are the people running the project, the developers, you know, working with the local communities and how are they supporting the local communities? Are they doing procurement with the Indigenous partners or the Indigenous communities local nearby? Are they hiring people locally? And so there's there's many like attributes within each of the SNG, but, um, and all of them for me, uh, in the work that I do, I underline all of it with Indigenous, and they are all. In, there's interdependencies between the three, but um, you know, I underline it with, you know, that Indigenous contribution and thinking about the UN Declaration um, and Sustainable Development Goals uh, issued by the UN. Okay, good, good answer. Okay, last question then to the panel as a whole. Uh, what kind, what advice do you have for the communities and entrepreneurs here that are looking to? Um, gain better access to private capital for their projects? And specifically, how can they do a better job of blending public sector or capital from the public sector with capital from the private sector? We'll start with Hillary. Sure, thanks. You know, I thought about this question quite a bit actually. And you know, whether you're First Nations, Métis or Inuit, um, when, when you're bringing a project to the bank, you know, we can only invest really in shovel ready projects. Um, and so for us to be able to transact quickly, as quickly as often the communities want to, uh, to move their projects forward, you know, we're, it's faster for us if there's a shovel ready project. And that means that there's a, a, a fairly solid business case. Um, there's financial projections and a financial model that's been developed and, and vetted. Um, and then the project design work is finished. The exception to this is some of our large projects and some of the more, more complex projects um, that really need some of that seed capital uh, could come earlier to us. But typically our recommendation is that, you know, those projects and entrepreneurs community seek government grants in order that they can actually meet um, and close that, that information gap. So an investor, whether it's the CIB or whether it's the First Nation Financing Authority or whether it's, you know, uh, VCIB or any other, or Spring Lane or any other investor, um, they're going to be looking for these types of things, and you want to have that developed. and And I highly recommend that you look at where 
uh, government grants are available so that you can really do that early development work to bring a, a shovel ready project and and um, and move it forward uh, in a timely fashion and in, in the time that the community is looking to move it forward. Okay, thanks. Nate, okay. are you there? This is this is also a question I, I thought a lot about and one that, that really interests me and, and interests us as a firm because we, we deal with a lot of um, early stage projects from from all different sorts of people. And I think the most important thing, uh, we can get involved in projects a little a little earlier perhaps than than, uh, than Hillary and, and CIB and, and, and do try to actively work with our partners to um, you know, develop the right contracts and, 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 uh, and structure that is needed for, to, for success. Uh, but my word of advice really is to, to put yourself in the shoes of investors. And, and, and we're all about, for the most part, trying to, when it comes to projects, it's trying to, um, the nature of project investing is that there's, there's often not recourse beyond the projects. The project itself has to stand on its own two feet. And that means you need to have um, uh, you know, a strong business case, the permitting needs to, to, to be there. Basically, all the risks that could happen need to be, need to be thought about and, 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 and addressed in, in some way. So risks like construction overruns or um, how you're going to get paid or, or, or those type of things. And um, we, we do a lot of work on this. We're actually putting on what we're calling a, a developer university for kind of emerging clean tech uh, CEOs in, in, in a few weeks in Toronto, and, and we're basically go, spending two days going through exactly this. You know, what do you need to do to develop a project, and then how do you utilize project finance? And that, that perhaps could be something that uh, that could be interesting for this sector as well. To kind of uh, put on a, a, a similar um, workshop for for interested uh, parties on on you know how we look at projects and how they're financed. That's I a, think that's a really good idea. That, Pardon me? I said that's a really good idea. I think this is a group that would have a lot of Yeah, I mean, just to, just to expound on that for a minute, I mean, there's a lot of accelerators that focus really on, on you know, IT and tech and all this, and, and there are almost none that focus on actual nuts and bolts getting stuff built. And in, in the clean tech space, that's, you know, that's more than half the battle. It's not going to be one, one in the cloud. It's going to be building stuff that actually um, take, you know, mitigate C, CO2 and all that. I think uh, I do want to say, if you'll permit me, a couple words on 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 what I feel, you know, government and and, and policymakers and 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 folks can can do to uh, to um, to push things forward. Uh, I mean, I, again, I came here to learn, so I don't have as much, uh, perhaps, the most in-depth knowledge of the sector. But as from the investor's perspective, I think that there are three things that that are really really important. One, I think that the most effective way, in my mind, is Governments of some stripe, whether it's at the utility level, at the, the federal level, provincial level, or, or, or at the, the First Nations level, need to be willing to make long-term commitments. And so it, it shift away from annual diesel subsidies to how do we, because with renewable energy, you're basically financing your fuel up front, whether it's batteries, wind, storage, hydro, the, the, the fuel is free once you've built the asset. Uh, or more or less, and so, and that means that that you're that it's more expensive up front. So, so to to finance that, there needs to be long term commitments. Second, and there's no easy to answer to this one, but the permitting and jurisdiction jurisdictional issues are extremely thorny, and and everyone from CIB on down, and you know, I, I really appreciate the perspective that CIB and my limited dealings with them has brought to this, and they're really willing to to think outside the the permitting box, but. There's still certain things you need to have the right to operate, and in many cases, that's not clear in in, in the context of of, um, of 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 First Nations and and you know whose jurisdiction is it and and, and where do you get permission? Uh, and, and then finally, I think on, on the government side, whatever government that may be, there needs to be folks who understand project finance and projects to be able to draft the documents, to be able to uh, understand what it is they're financing. And you know, a lot of successful projects in the US, for example, when they, they under the Obama administration, they set up a, 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 um, a special team filled with project finance lawyers to, to get you know, large scale energy projects and transmission projects up because they realize that uh, the, that, that's, that's a, those are skill sets that are not necessarily there already. And, and these, we will never get to scale getting communities off diesel unless there are 
folks um, uh, that understand, you know, how to how to draft and and and, and sign off on power purchase agreements and and loan documentation and all that. And I, I think that's critical to, to success. And, and I will say that I think, you know, CIB is doing their very best to, to fill that gap. And it's, 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 uh, it's uh, much appreciated, but there needs to be more of that if we're, if we're gonna get accomplished what, what needs to happen by, by 2030. Sorry, yeah. I took a little more than my five minutes there. No, that, that's okay, thanks. I, I think everybody in this room is in fierce agreement with you on the three things that need to happen. Vince. Um, so 30,000 foot view. Whenever I look at a project, and my team looks at a project, and all financial institutions look at the same thing, what is the input? Question one, or criteria one. Is it solar, wind, water, whatever? Criteria two, what is the technology that churns that input into an, an output which is heating, cooling, energy? And then who's the offtake? Who's going to buy that and at what rate? And 30,000 foot view, that cri those four criteria or that process is what I look at and em every other financial institution will look at to see how we can finance a project. And the last part is critical, which is who's the offtake and what are they paying? Because you can, you can rest, you can hang your hat really on that fourth criteria and work it all the way through. In terms of uh, you know, what we're financing, we're financing construction financing, as I mentioned earlier, uh, senior secured debt, sub debt, um, slowly getting into equity, uh, but that, that's, that's sort of a, a, a longer grind uh, for us right now, but we're really in the debt part of the, of the capital structure. And the last part, in terms of how all of you can access capital, I'm gonna quote Linda, meet Ernie and I at the bar at the end of the, <laughs> end of the, uh, end of the day. You might, you might regret that, Vince. <laughs> okay, Ernie. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, so uh, what, as I mentioned earlier, we look at the, we look at the First Nations uh, revenue streams. That really determines how much they can borrow. And the, we're, we're, we're not, we don't want to be in a position where we're going to put First Nations in a highly leveraged uh, position. Um, and we don't want them to use other revenues that they use for their operations. So it's, for us, it's really, it's, it's, the, it's the revenue stream that the First Nations have to determine a project. And we can finance 100% of a project. Uh, we, can do, uh, we can do takeout financing as well. Uh, for example, we, some of the communities that we financed had uh, interest rates of 10%. It's not, I know it's not too bad today because interest rates are pretty high, right? But back a year ago, two years ago, 10% interest rates were pretty high. And so, you know, if you're investing like millions of dollars, and if you can get a rate of around, like uh, uh, our second last adventure was at 1.9% fixed for 10 years. So you, you do the math yourself, like you, you've got a significant saving. So that really helps the First Nations in uh, generating cash flow, what they need for their operations and their, their community. So that's what we do. We, it's, again, we work with the First Nations, they're in the driver's seat. We, we assess whether the project is good or not. We will engage the professionals that we need to make that assessment at, at our cost. And there's really no cost to the First Nation. There's no cost of application fees. There's no cost at all to get involved. And so we're about building capacity. We're about uh, providing the, the, the best financing we can to them based on their ability to pay that debt. So that's really important. And so, I, I, you know, I, I talked about uh, what government could do. And government, I think, needs to provide a revenue stream. They need to provide at least revenue sharing to our nation so that we can actually leverage that into uh, really uh, accessing financing, wherever you're getting it from, to build what you need. And so I actually, uh, I, I, I have a video that I actually brought with me. And if, uh, if we could play it now, I wouldn't mind. It illustrates the concept of monetization that we're putting forward, we've been putting forward to the government of Canada for some time, and we're getting really close to seeing it come to fruition. So um, I, I, if, if you don't mind, uh, go ahead. So what is monetization and how would it benefit your communities? First of all, it is a new approach that would signal a new relationship on the road to economic reconciliation with Canada. Monetization is used every day by people buying a home or a vehicle. 
Rather than saving the entire amount up front, we borrow through a loan or mortgage and then make payments over time using your paycheck. This is monetization. Unfortunately, Canada uses a pay-as-you-go model, which is the same as saving up cash, which only builds a few infrastructure projects each year. Monetization would build many projects and could help bridge the estimated $30 billion infrastructure gap, something the federal government has promised to do by 2030. These projects would be built today at today's prices, benefiting more communities than Canada's current pay-as-you-go model. Monetization would work like this. First Nations would submit to Canada their shovel-ready projects. Canada would approve which ones would proceed. FNFA would raise the financing needed to fund each community's approved project. Canada would direct the funding to FNFA to pay the loan service costs each year. Monetization could close the infrastructure gap much faster. Canada's annual budget can support a large number of projects today by committing to pay for them over a number of years, therefore stretching the budget. This would have a smaller impact on Canada's annual budget. Also, funding more projects at today's prices removes the risk that inflation will make tomorrow's projects unachievable. FNFA is the right vehicle to use for monetization because we are by First Nations, for First Nations, and governed by First Nations. FNFA has capital markets access to raise the financing. We are proposing a pilot project to prove that monetization can work. For example, Canada has a goal to end dependency on diesel energy in First Nations communities by 2030 and replace it with green energy. Under the current pay-as-you-go model, that's probably not achievable. If Canada instead were to recommit the current diesel costs of $58 million per year, FNFA could raise approximately $500 million in an infrastructure to venture. The $58 million would then be repurposed to service this $500 million debenture to be repaid over 10 years at perhaps no extra cost to Canada, just like a mortgage or a car loan. This would mean that up to 25 First Nations could make the switch to cleaner, less expensive, and a more reliable source of energy to power their homes and communities. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we've seen four different models in the, or four different approaches in the space uh, in terms of uh, capital that's potentially available. I think we have 10 minutes left, right, Nadine? 10 minutes left for questions? Yes, okay. So um, first of all, just I've been said to check with WOVA first. Are there any WOVA questions that up on the screen? Okay. Uh, what are the financing gaps for indigenous clean energy project that is not served by conventional financing? In other words, where is the greatest need for new financing models? I think a couple of our speakers uh, referenced this, but go ahead. Uh, maybe I'll just check virtually first. Hillary or Nate? Or maybe I can, I'm happy to start. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the biggest gap is actually the current cost of diesel is pretty expensive. Um, and when you're thinking about replacing diesel generators in remote communities, and I'm thinking across Inuit Noon and Ad, I'm thinking across the territories and the northern parts of the province on, on the diesel reliant communities. If you're not replacing it with transmission, you're replacing it with some solar and wind and maybe some storage, you still need to maintain your diesel backup generators. And so the, the utilities right now, um, and this is true, and we saw this, I, I worked on the Watkinia project in Northwestern Ontario, which was getting communities off diesel. That was using a transmission line. So you knew that you had a secure replacement to get the communities off diesel. Whereas with some of the renewable replacements, it's not a full replacement. So you need to maintain these diesel generators and there's a cost to that. Um, and you'll need to maintain, you know, bringing up diesel. You're going to use less diesel, but, you know, it's trying to balance the systems. And so I'm not an engineer or technologist, but there's a balance there. And so the utilities need to maintain at a cost diesel generators. They need to make sure there's diesel on hand so that when the wind's not blowing or the sun's not shining, 
they can continue to make sure that he, the community still has electricity and, and a reliable supply of electricity. And so I, we talk about the displaced cost of diesel. And so to get contracts from the utilities um, is, you know, they're looking at the cost that they pay currently for diesel and they don't want to pay more than they're already paying for diesel. But to bring up solar panels, wind farm, like wind turbines, you know, storage, it's really expensive. And so that displaced cost of diesel has to cover these costs. And so they, you know, enter into different types of contracts, depending on where you are, at different price points, because they don't want to be paying more than they're currently paying for diesel. And so sometimes the economics just really don't work um, on a 20-year contract, a 20-year PPA with the utility. And so... You know, there's a need for significant grants to get um, the project up and off the ground. And so the gap becomes like what part can actually be financed so that you can generate some revenue because you're building an electricity asset that should be generating some revenue from the contract. But there's not enough revenue coming to it um, to, you know, to warrant large sums of debt often. Um, and it's not always the case, but even in the example I gave, and I don't know if anybody's here from West, Northwestern Ontario and the Wate project, but even in those cases, because these are long lines, long transmission lines, the community still need backup generators of diesel because if it goes, if that one line goes out or there's a forest fire or a, an ice storm, communities still need reliable supply of energy. So it's really trying to figure out that balance of costing. And so, you know, utilities and, you know, working in uh, across Nunavut with communities, the, the utility in that case really has to, like it has an objective to make sure there's a reliable supply of energy and their focus right now is diesel and so you know it's really challenging to find the economics to bring in a lot of private lenders and and private equity for example because the economics just aren't there for those projects okay vince what what in your experience what has been that sort of valley of death that <laughs> is really hard to finance with these types of projects um so f from our experience and i, I think hillary touched on uh touched on it uh, perfectly in, in just basically making sure the capital structure is appropriate for the transactions. Um, I, so I think that, that that's the, the, the first piece. Uh, the, the second piece is having transactions that are actually ready uh, and working with, w working with developers. I know that's getting away from sort of the, 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 the capital structure uh, uh, point, but I think working with developers um, um, to, to make sure that their projects are moving along the process in a timely fashion, I, I think is important because, as you all know, infrastructure projects take a long time, and uh, you know th there there are opportunities where, uh, and we do this a lot with our clients, where we work with our clients to ensure, um, uh, you know, working with advisors, uh, uh, etc to make sure that the project moves uh, at, at a quick enough uh, clip uh, so that the cost of capital doesn't become an issue. Okay, okay, um, Chris is at the bike here, but I'm just gonna call out to Victoria in the multi-purpose room. Victoria, is there a question there? We've got one here. Multi-purpose room, come in. Any questions here? Mm -hmm. Linda, I don't think so. Okay, Thanks. okay, good, Chris. Thanks very much, Linda, and people you know me, but some you don't, but Hillary does, but Vince and Nate, and Ernie, you don't, but I'm the head of Indigenous Clean Energy, and I've done 35 to 40 major clean energy projects around the country. Vince, you did say something that was important that we have to work together, because here's the problem with the disconnect, and it's fundamentally in your last point, it's the off-take agreements. So, I mean, right now I've got off-grid projects in Inukjuak in Quebec, which is a $125 million hydro project, stuff in Maine, as Hillary would know, in, uh, in Labrador. But I'll be honest, and I'm going to break some China, which is what I said I'd do if I see something not working. There are certain jurisdictions, NWT, I'll be honest, Manitoba, I'll be honest, um, Nunavut, I'll be honest, where, and some parts of BC, where the structures of offtake don't exist that don't allow to do what you propose to occur. We need to change that and educate the regulators, the provincial governments, and utilities that it is in our shared interest to go there. So there is intent in this room, there is intent in the indigenous Turtle Island to move forward in these areas on off-grid communities, but the offtake barrier is significant and is partly what Hillary's mentioned, but it's more than that. Sometimes it's just even not a sharing of uh, par purchase agreement terms and pricing because, quote unquote, they have to be confidential. I find that's just a bunch of hooey. So there's a change force here to make this work 
I do think there's a very real role in private capital supporting indigenous communities to be co-owners of projects. I've done over two billion of those projects in the last 20 years. But there's a disconnect in some jurisdictions and we gotta change that China. So, um, uh, I, I completely hear you on that. When I'm referring to offtake, I just don't necessarily mean a public sector offtake. I mean merchant, so market offtake. I mean uh, corporate PPAs, you know, or a hybrid of it. So I'm I'm completely uh, with you. So uh, you know, the natural assumption is it's always back to government, and it can always, it can be a hybrid. And we've worked on a couple of offtakes where you have that hybrid. But your your point is very well taken. Okay, Nate, do you want to come in on this one? It speaks to the point that you made about permitting and regulation. I, I mean, I think, you know, I think Chris, we've spoken once or twice, but that, that's exactly it, uh, you know, and, and being a little bit removed from the situation, what I, it, it's, it's funny, I was crunching some numbers this morning about just how big and yet also how small the problem is. I mean, if, if you look in aggregate of the, you know, the, 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 the 50 or 60 odd communities that are, that are remote, really, in, in, in Canada, and um, it's not a huge amount of money comparatively uh, when you when you look at at, at budget other budget lines and um, it's buried in a thicket of you know interjurisdictional between the province territory you know First Nation itself what have you that make things really difficult but if but you know it's 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 not a huge amount of money so one thing that if if, if you could put your heads together and come up with some sort of blanket offtake or, or or some overarching framework and and i imagine that's easier said than done um you you, you could unlock that that relatively quickly for for not a huge amount of money and you know i've always been a favor of of programs that provide um, support to the project once it's built, so some sort of PPA or or, or uh, offtake as opposed to grants, which in my experience, they have their place, but can be very challenging to to tick all the boxes and, and shoehorn a project into um, into a, you know the, the way that it needs to be. It doesn't provide developers necessarily certainty that they'll they'll get it, and, and if you know the, the envelope fills up or what have you, and also can end up you know financing projects that that aren't necessarily um, uh, operational and that, you know, if you have a PPA, you only start paying once the project is, is up and running. So that, that's my two cents. Okay. Okay. We've got one, uh, we're actually now over time. I'm going to going to get in big trouble with Nadine, but go ahead. We have one last question here. All right. And we'll give it to Ernie. Okay. Thank you. My name is Andy Birti. I'm from uh, Quebec, uh, Northern, uh, Northern Quebec, Nunavik, we call it working um, as a new guy, uh, this uh, energy company. We, uh, 2017, it was created. And we'll be working with the 12 communities, um, microgrids, and trying to uh, get to um, uh, cleaner energy. My question is, I heard that uh, a few times, a nonprofit uh, doing this um, financing. Um, at the same time, of course, there will be uh, some uh, rates for uh, lending the money. My question is, I know that uh, you need equity to work with, and at the same time, you need to also uh, working capital to consider. Um, how do you determine the rate? Because if you tell me because of uh, the risk of the project, that's how banks work, and uh, that's how they make money, I, th I believe. But if you cover yourself a nonprofit, um, I think you would consider preserving your capital and also affording your um, working capital. Um, so that's my question. How do you determine your rate? Okay, and human capital too. Ernie, it's made for you. Okay, I think I got all of it. <laughs> uh, so <coughs> we, uh, the, way, the, the way we're, uh, we're set up is that uh, our interest rates are determined by uh, when we go to the capital markets when we issue a, deb a debenture. So it's, it's what, whatever is in the capital at uh, the capital markets at that point in time. Now, we also uh, provide uh, interim financing for um, uh, startups, uh, construction, and that that uh, 
we finance that in a cap of markets ourselves. So we issue our own commercial paper and then we mark it up to cover our cost. But because we're working with our members, if, if we raise it and try to make a profit, we're just gonna end up giving the profit back. <clears throat> so, so we don't, we don't, we don't do that. So we just, we pass that savings on to the First Nation. And we do finance equity, we do finance working capital, and we do finance uh, the whole construction of the project, uh, the completion, and um, you know, it's, it's based on the, the everybody, I heard it this morning, is talking about the power purchase agreement that you can get, it's really, really, in, really important in t determining w whether or not you can uh, cover the financing with, with that cost and what other revenues you have to do that if you really want to do it. But uh, yeah, so we, uh, we can work with the First Nation. We work with the First Nation that's really tailored to them. And I think everybody else does that here. So I think you should have a conversation afterwards. So, okay, thank you. That uh, ends our session. And um, Grant, you know, Jacob for financing his idea. You know, I'm, can you just convey this to him, what he has to do here? <laughs> okay, thank you, everyone. <laughs>